Hello and welcome to another live presentation here on my channel, Luis Borrero Visual Artist. I'd like to thank everyone for coming by. Uh, today I have a really exciting presentation about Grisaille techniques and the Renaissance artists that uh, innovated these wonderful techniques. And uh, again, for those of you that are coming by every single week and uh, writing the com wonderful comments and the wonderful feedback, I'd like to thank everyone uh, for uh, your wonderful comments, wonderful feedback. So, all right, well, let's just go ahead and get started. So, um, I've done uh, a lot of lives uh, dealing with uh, just uh, various techniques. Uh, and remember that the channel is uh, focused on uh, Renaissance and also 19th cent all the way through 19th century. 19th century uh, techniques on drawing and painting. So there's uh, uh, an in-depth study uh, about some of these techniques that uh, artists from the past have used. Uh, so in one of the things that I like to do is just to share the knowledge that I've uh, been gathering throughout the years, uh, the re uh, especially the sources, uh, which is really important with any research, it's important to share uh, the sources and uh, I love uh, looking through these wonderful books and I like to share some of the books that I'm using uh, as reference. Uh, just uh, some wonderful books uh, that I've been uh, collecting throughout the years. This is a wonderful book, Looking Through Paintings. Uh, I, th I believe this is from Archetype uh, Publications. Wonderful book. I got it from uh, Kramer Pigments. Uh, wonderful book on the uh, research, the art historical uh, research projects that a lot of museums have been going through uh, in the last 20 years. So this is a, comp uh, uh, I guess, a compilation of uh, the, that wonderful research that a lot of uh, uh, restorers throughout the world have been compiling. And it's there's a few chapters here. And um, I will be talking about a reference that I make later on uh, to, uh, to the uh, Guild of San Lucas and some of their um, ordinances on uh, the use of materials that they have for artists. So uh, I'm going to be looking uh, through this book and uh, showing you some of the, the chapters. Uh, also another book that I always mention here, and it's, this is, I believe, one of the most important books uh, in, in, the, in terms of technique, um, and really just looking at how artists uh, were trained, the materials, uh, and the theories. And uh, this book is in Spanish, unfortunately, for those of you that speak English. I don't believe there's a translation. Perhaps there is. But Francisco Pacheco, El Arte de la Pintura. Uh, Francisco Pacheco was Velasquez's teacher, as I've mentioned many times here. Wonderful book. I'm always making references to it. Uh, it's uh, a book that is used extensively in, uh, in art research uh, in terms of uh, theories and uh, some of the methods and practices of the age. Uh, another amazing book that keeps coming up in just about every great list of art books is Senino de Andrea Senini, The Craftsman's Handbook, uh, El Libro del Arte. This is a wonderful book. It predates the uh, Arte de la Pintura from Francisco Pacheco. Uh, it's a book from uh, the Quattrocento, uh, early Renaissance. And it's a wonderful uh, guide to um, just about all the techniques used uh, throughout the Renaissance or early Renaissance and pioneered by uh, Giotto and later on Leonardo da Vinci and uh, just a, a wonderful array of techniques and documentation here in this book. Another new book that I'm introducing today that I have not used here before is this wonderful book published by the uh, National Gallery uh, in London. Uh, it's a uh, Dura to Veronese, uh, 16th century painting in the National Gallery. Wonderful book. The National Gallery for years uh, has been doing a lot of wonderful research uh, on the techniques uh, of a lot of artists from uh, the early 14th through the 19th century. And they have a, a publication uh, online. It's called the National Gallery Technical Bulletin. 
you could access that information uh, right through their website and there you could see it. just a lot of wonderful research on uh, uh, techniques uh, that artists have been using uh, all throughout the Renaissance all, all the way up to 19th century I believe even some uh, contemporary artists as well so all right let's just go ahead and get started um, today uh, I'm talking about Grisaille techniques used by Renaissance artists and what is exactly a, a Grisaille? Well essentially a Grisaille is a monochromatic uh, painting uh, it's, it serves as a sort of uh, precursor to an actual uh, painting it's, uh, it was used to uh, build up layers uh, and to establish tonal, a tonal range all throughout uh, a, a finished work of art and, um, and this technique doesn't just appear uh, in Renaissance painting there's an evolution that I like to talk about just with about every technique that I talk about here I'll, I'm very much interested in the evolution of these techniques and the mechanics of the techniques uh, today we take for granted a lot of the knowledge that has been passed down but um, during the Renaissance artists were innovating some of these techniques researching and the knowledge sort of stayed together in a studio setting and it was passed down to another uh, generation of artists and uh, in, in terms of the Grisaille techniques uh, it's important to look back today uh, a lot of academic painters uh, following 19th century styles uh, used the Grisaille but it predates uh, that age and it goes all the way back to Andrea uh, de Sanini, uh, Sanino Sanini, excuse me. Um, and he describes a wonderful technique that predates Grisaille and is called Verdascio. The Verdascio technique essentially is working uh, with uh, white and terra verde and creating um, a beautiful, just subtle tone uh, in if, if well let's just go ahead and pull up an image from an early uh, anonymous uh, early Renaissance artist so you can see here this is a wonderful image um, and a lot of the image that I'm sharing here they're images from uh, my uh, trip to Italy last summer I took these images and I'm sharing them with you here uh, this is a wonderful painting uh, you can see here uh, the use of verdascio. So what is verdascio? Well essentially the flesh color is prepared in tones of green. Uh, in Sanino Sanini in this book mentions uh, the use of verdascio and how to establish the verdascio with just white lead and terra verde and how to mix the values and then later on when it's dry you, you do uh, velaturas or veladuras on top of that verdascio underpainting and uh, in page 92 of the book uh, he describes in detail how to go ahead and work with this technique and uh, he describes for the first time of, I believe in the history of painting the use of optical color uh, he goes on to describe the use of a a layer of paint that will uh, be applied on top of this greenish undercoat and uh, he's very adamant about and, and I quote here um, so let's see he's he mentions not to cover entirely the Verdascio painting so let's just go ahead and read just a passage so you could uh, have an idea of I'm sorry the page is 94 page 94 um, so it says here when you're putting on the first sphinx do not have it straight vermilion have a little white lead in it and also put a little white lead into the verdasho with which you shade it first just exactly as you work and paint on a wall in just the same method make three values of flesh color each lighter than the other laying each flesh color in its place on the areas of the face still do not work up so close to the Verdascio shadows as to cover them entirely so there you begin to see how um, this technique there was a mechanism or a system in which uh, he describes uh, a very straightforward technique of just using three colors um, 
to darken the colors, uh, some artists use black as well. And um, later on, he's applying, finishing the painting with uh, just a very thin veil of paint called Belladura to get that sort of effect. And why is he using the green? Well, uh, the complement of red or pink would be a greenish color. So you're there using uh, optical complementary color, which is very effective as you see in the painting that uh, is posted here. So this is really the beginning and the evolution of Grisaille painting. Um, and let's just go ahead and move on to a wonderful artist uh, that we all know, uh, Leonardo da Vinci. And Leonardo da Vinci is key to this technique because um, he's one of the first artists that begins uh, to innovate this wonderful technique of uh, Verdasio. And he begins to do um, some very extensive underpaintings in a very sort of transparent color. And then he begins to work the paint with just black and white. Um, and in this wonderful uh, image here, uh, taken directly from the uh, painting, the Uffizi, this is the adoration of the Magi, and it's a detail. And there you can, you can see how Leonardo's sort of working with a very extensive underdrawing, which I've mentioned here before. And he begins to build up the flesh colors in black and white. And which, I mean, essentially he's, he's working from the Verdascio technique, which is, you know, it would have been a standard technique that he would have learned in the studio of Verrocchio. Uh, this was the standard practice, and why are they doing this? Well, uh, it's important to understand why the reasons why you would use Verdascio or Grisai. One of them, and I just like to point out uh, four main reasons, uh, tradition. So you would be learning how to do this from your teacher. This gender, uh, this, excuse me, this knowledge would be passed on uh, to the next generation of artists. And of course, you would learn this as a system. But the other reason would be also the cost of pigments. Um, when you use vermilion, vermilion is a costly pigment. It's manufactured. Um, the same thing with uh, white lead. These are sort of expensive pigments. And uh, you would need you know, a lot of heavy sort of pasty paint to cover the surface. So um, you by using monochromatic paints and veiling the top layers with very fine colors or the more expensive colors, you're essentially cutting cost. Uh, today, we take for granted the fact that we could go and buy a tube of paint at any art store and it costs very little money. But in the old days, artists had to manufacture their pigments or uh, they would have to essentially mix the paint, prepare the paint by hand, and it, there was a cost involved. And also, there is a very interesting um, aspect uh, through this. I, I, through my research here, I've discovered something very, very interesting is that there was in 1546, there was an ordinance from the Guild of St. Lucas um, up in Holland uh, to, uh, for artists, it called for artists to, uh, they were obliged to work with a dead color uh, underpainting because there was uh, already a preoccupation with conservation, which is, this is an important aspect of this technique as we are going to observe later on. Uh, artists such as Caravaggio began to use this uh, very technique over very dark grounds, and the dark grounds with time will darken the painting. So um, you would really need to have a very solid underpaint to be able to apply the color on top. Today we take for granted this, the, the, the use of uh, very pure color. The Impressionists during the 19th century uh, began using straight local color, meaning they mixed the color on the palette and they applied it on a white surface. But in the old days, that was not the case. Uh, there was a system of drawing and uh, dead coloring and then uh, layering the final layers of fine uh, pigments. Um, and the last reason that they were using this, is, of course, is the, uh, the aesthetics and the style that the artists would have been practicing, which is so important 
to the development of painting. So um, just in short, uh, you have a system of painting that allows artists to work uh, with economical means. They're under uh, layers of light and shade, and later on, uh, you get to uh, explore uh, more saturated color by just layering these thin veils. That's really essentially how this technique develops, uh, and it's the way that a lot of artists use it today as well. All right, so let's just go ahead and look at some other artists from uh, Leonardo's uh, time that also use this technique. In particular, I want to share with you uh, Andrea del Sarto. I love Andrea del Sarto. He's a wonderful artist from the Renaissance, and I'd like to share this uh, detail. This is a, a wonderful painting at the Uffizi. Uh, yeah, or I'm sorry, Palazzo Pitti in, uh, in Florence. And here you can see a pretty straightforward black and white paint uh, underpainting. And uh, Andrea del Sarto does these very, very light uh, velaturas on top uh, in the cheek. You can see there uh, he's just sort of veiling the paint. And Veiling the paint is really just, uh, there's many ways to veil the paint over uh, a grisaille underpainting. I'm going to be demonstrating how to achieve that effect later on. But you could mix the paint with uh, some uh, oil, uh, drying oil, and then just create a very sort of, uh, sort of transparent uh, veil of, of opaque paint with white lead. Uh, there's also uh, ways to make the white lead a lot more transparent by uh, mixing white, uh, excuse me, calcite into it. And this, these are ways that artists use. So by after finishing the whole painting in black and white, the artist would mix this uh, very, uh, very thin veil of pink with white and uh, vermilion and white, and then they would just veil it on the, on the top planes uh, very gently and letting that gray color show through. And this results in some very beautiful effects, a lot of depth, and uh, a lot of subtlety, too. It, it's, uh, it, it's very interesting how it sort of resembles nature. I mean, when you look at uh, here, just even in my hand, there's layers of flesh that it's, uh, this technique sort of imitates that effect. Uh, this is not just one solid color. This is just, you know, Lay, thin layers of flesh, and you can see this, uh, uh, well, I guess, total effect uh, of color just being mixed together. So um, this works in the same way. Um, there's another artist that sort of innovated this technique. Now, it's important to mention Andrea del Sarto is using a light ground and building in the same thing with Leonardo da Vinci. They're using light grounds with an imprimatura, much like this. This is a light ground with a veil, in, uh, an imprimatura, which is a thin veil of paint, and then building the grisaille layer on top uh, opaquely. Um, so you wouldn't really get a lot of optical color out of this, uh, except you have to mix the tones individually. So, um, and that's a, some, that's a, a, a very important fact that we're going to be uh, learning today. Uh, we're going to be uh, exploring uh, optical color versus the ac an actual mix gray. So um, let's just go ahead and take a look at uh, another wonderful artist, Giorgione, a uh, Venetian painter uh, that I mentioned last week. Um, he worked alongside Titian. And this is a wonderful detail um, of a painting again at the Palazzo Pitti uh, in Florence. Um, this is now you see that there's a, the, the very wonderful detail of the layers of paint. I mean, from uh, uh, a distance, all these layers come together, but in this close up, you see the gray under layer and the very thin veils of color on top of this uh, gray, uh, grayish uh, grisaille painting underneath. Um, now, there's something wonderful that happens in. Uh, in the north of Italy uh, during the late Renaissance, and it's the development of the Venetian style, which I mentioned last week. Um, so artists began to use uh, gray grounds. 
um, they begin to use uh, gray grounds and dark grounds. Okay, and let me just go ahead and show you here. Uh, they also begin to use reddish ground. This is a wonderful uh, reddish ground canvas that I've, uh, I've mentioned here before. Um, it's, now, this technique develops in uh, Brescia, uh, north, uh, the north part of Italy, near Venice, and artists adapt this technique. There's uh, a whole array of painters, such as Correggio, that use this technique, and they begin to uh, layer the grisaille layer, uh, or the grisaille underpainting, on top of this very uh, sort of rich reddish ground. Uh, they were also using a gray, dark gray ground. And by the time that we uh, explore uh, Caravaggio's uh, innovations, which I want to show you a painting here of Caravaggio, uh, late, late Caravaggio. Uh, this painting uh, is in, um, I believe, in New York. Um, this is a detail. This is, this is a painting from the National, no, excuse me, the Metropolitan Museum in New York. And here you see how Caravaggio is using sort of a chocolate um, color ground. And there's something wonderful that, uh, that's happening in this painting. And it's the use of optical color or an optical gray. Very different from mixing a gray, uh, a gray shade on your palette. So by Caravaggio just using straight white and just dragging it across the surface, he's dragging that. Uh, and I'm going to demonstrate how that works. You take the straight white uh, lead and you drag it, um, you know, very gently over this dark ground. You get this optical gray uh, effect, which is uh, quite revolutionary. Um, and he would build up these uh, very opaque, sort of heavy opaque uh, under layers, and on top of that, he would veil his um, his color. Um, now, not all artists were working, uh, you know, with this techniques, and this that's one of the most interesting things about studying techniques. Uh, we tend to think to simplify, uh, you know, I see it all the time. Uh, artists, uh, you know, tend to simplify these techniques and say, well, this is the way that Caravaggio was working, or this is the way that Velasquez was working. Uh, within, uh, you know, an, uh, an artist, a group of paintings, and, um, and the development of, a, of each individual artist, you see differences in experiments all throughout um, their uh, production of a lifetime. So, uh, and that's very interesting here. I mean, Caravaggio early on starts using uh, an uh, orange ground um, and even a light grayish ground. And then by the time that he uh, was uh, almost to the end of his life, he starts using a chocolate a color ground, very dark ground, and using higher contrast. I want to uh, uh, show you here um, a painting from an anonymous artist, a uh, contemporary of uh, Caravaggio. Um, and this is a, a painting at the Uffizi Gallery, wonderful painting. Um, and here you can see uh, the technique. Uh, this is an unfinished painting, which I love going through museums and uh, finding unfinished paintings because you could see the mechanics of the technique. Um, here you see uh, an orange, orange sort of uh, earth orange ground, and the artist is using just black and white, perhaps even a brownish color to lay in the drawing and to warm up the uh, the uh, black, uh, you know, give the the black color a warmer uh, temperature. But it's it, it's he's not really using that much optical color. Uh, he's mixing the grays on the palette and applying it on directly on the over the uh, orange ground. And this is very much the method that Caravaggio would have been using early on. Um, it's important to mention this because um, there's, there's a significant difference between using an optical gray and a mixed gray. So by using a darker ground, you would have to, uh, uh, I mean, you can't really get a lot of, a deep range of grays. Um, because you're not getting the, that full range. So here the artist uh, had to mix the grays 
directly on the palette and apply them. Um, if you use a very dark ground, then you could uh, take advantage of the uh, turbid medium effect, uh, which is an optical gray. And this is a, an important aspect of uh, this technique. And uh, I'm going to be demonstrating in a little bit how this all works. Um, so there you begin to see the an innovation, uh, even within an, art, uh, an artist's uh, uh, full life production, uh, you see that he early on he's using uh, a mixed gray and then he switches to an optical gray and uh, paint some of these paintings have both effects side by side and uh, it just shows you the level of experimentation that was going on with artists using some of these uh, time-proven techniques and innovating some new ways of working uh, with uh, the idea of Verdasho transformed into a grisaille. So let's just go ahead and uh, take a look at another wonderful artist um, that worked uh, in this style, and it's uh, Guido Reni. Um, this is a wonderful example of an artist that uh, was working with perhaps a hybrid of both. Um, this painting is in the Capo de Monte Museum in Naples, and I, I was very impressed with this painting, um, it's called the Four Seasons. And um, when I studied this painting up close, I noticed that uh, I couldn't really <laughs> make up my mind whether it was a Verdasio or a Grisai. And uh, it was definitely painted on a very dark ground. And the, this, the paint was very, very smooth. Uh, you, you see the use of uh, a mixed um, gray and also optical grays. So the artist is employing both ways of painting. And something that I observed is a very thin veil of uh, sort of a greenish uh, terror-like color over the grisaille. And then the artist worked the velatura on top with the pinkish tones, uh, which I've never really uh, seen this way of working before. I usually just have an artist just apply the velatura um, right on top of the, the underlayer. But here you see almost like a local imprimatura, meaning that the artists apply uh, a, a very, very thin glaze of, of verdasho over the grisaille, perhaps to cool it down and get it more of a greenish effect. So very interesting. I really enjoyed um, seeing how uh, an artist like Guido Reni uh, is yet innovating the technique once again of grisaille. So um, really interesting way of uh, working. And uh, th by the time that uh, y you know, you're, you're start studying um, 17th century artists, you begin to see uh, variations of Caravaggio's uh, innovations. I want to show you um, a painting by Valent Valentin Pallone. Uh, he was a follower of Caravaggio, and um, okay, let's see, let's see another image. I believe this is the uh, an anonymous uh, Neapolitan painter. There we go. Um, so, so there is a uh, an unfinished painting. This was at the um, uh, this was in Rome uh, in um, uh, Barberini castle, I believe, uh, or palace, Palazzo Barberini in uh, Rome. And this is a painting on an unfinished, well, it seems like a finished and left unfinished in areas, uh, painting by Valentin Ballon, a uh, wonderful painting. And there you can see uh, the grisaille layer, and he lightly applies uh, almost like a very heavy, heavy opaque velatura color right over the grisaille. And in the hair, you begin to see how he leaves the ground, the dark chocolate ground. Um, he just veils it with a dark layer of paint. A very interesting use of the technique. Um, and on, right next to this, uh, you see another artist. This is an anonymous Neapolitan painter. And you, there you see a, a very opaque grisaille layer with just heightenings of um, uh, overpainting or a local color on, right on top of the grisaille. He's not really using uh, the, the effect of Velatura. He 
is just choosing to paint opaquely right on top or semi-opaquely on top of the glissade layer. And these are important considerations when you're uh, just making up your, mind, your own mind about how to use grisaille. Um, there's just not one way to use grisaille uh, underpaintings. Uh, it seems like artists uh, use the basic concept of grisaille under layers and innovated uh, the technique to suit their uh, artistic expression. So this is very, very important uh, when you're uh, just, you know, uh, trying to set up your own paintings. And why use a grisaille layer at all? Uh, well, it, if you're working on a very dark ground or even, a, you know, on a light ground, I just want to show you here uh, just two examples. Let me see here. This is uh, just a sphere study that I've done. Uh, to demonstrate this technique. Um, this is, uh, let's see, let me just take a look at it. So I have here uh, a, a semi-opaque layer of paint uh, over uh, a light ground with an imprimatura. This is more of a Flemish method of painting. It's the method that Leonardo would have been using uh, and also Andrea del Sarto, the Florentine method where you have a light ground and just uh, the mixed uh, range of grays and apply, you know, in a, you know, a, a opaque way and then with some glazing at the, uh, at the end just to push the darks. Very straightforward system. Um, but by the time that you get into Caravaggio's, uh, let's see here, let's just take a look at, let me just move some of these books out of the way. Just show you uh, this palette, and I will need uh, Francisco Pacheco's book because I he describes uh, these methods. Okay, so so uh, I want to just uh, make a reference here, uh, just in terms of working methods. Um, Francisco Pacheco's book is probably the most complete, and and also Palomino. Um, in describing some of the methods from the 17th century. And he mentions uh, the proper method, as he uh, describes it, to uh, begin a painting. And he, uh, he goes on to uh, describe uh, the method of some uh, artists uh, from the time. And he says um, that some artists begin with bla blanco y negro, which is black and white. Okay. And he also mentions that some artists begin with uh, carmine, okay, which is this color right here, scochino, and white and umber, okay, or sombra de Italia, uh, and to begin their paintings over. Now he goes on to describe the preparation of a dark ground, um, a, a civilian uh, dark ground, which uh, yield. Let's see, it would be something. So, sort of similar to this color, okay? This is a, a, a civilian uh, earth ground. This is a, a sombra, uh, sombra de España, which is a, it's a sort of a ochre, sienaish ground, uh, similar to perhaps what he would have been describing. Um, it's a piece of linen with just rabbit skin glue and uh, a layer uh, two layers, excuse me, of the uh, uh, Spanish earth uh, or the sombra, uh, Spanish sombra. Uh, and over this, they would have been using uh, a grisaille. Uh, grisaille, any of these layers uh, or any of these palettes, excuse me, and uh, just applying, uh, you know, the tones, mixing the tones and applying them. Um, and he goes on to describe the way that he works, and it's interesting because he says this is a very uh, easy way uh, for those of you, for those artists that do not have a lot of confidence in drawing, and um, and they could move it around and they could, uh, you know, choose the right tones, and uh, there's a lot of 
uh, brave men that have used this technique. But on my own opinion, I am the one. I'm, a, I'm of the the opinion. Excuse me. I'm of the opinion that it's important to use all the colors from the beginning. Um, and then he goes on to describe the full palette. Um, this is very telling because uh, Velasquez is an artist that uses uh, a full palette and was not using, uh, at least not in his later uh, period, uh, a full, uh, excuse me, a grisaille underlayer. So uh, even by the mid 17th century, the idea of grisaille was already being challenged by uh, even authors like uh, Francisco Pacheco. And uh, by the 18th century, uh, this technique is uh, sort of abandoned by a lot of artists. And it, there's a revival later on in the 19th century. A lot of academic painters, such as Ang, uh, use the grisaille uh, to establish underpaintings. So it's interesting to see it, the, the, the history of the grisaille and by the time of the Impressionists, this technique is uh, fully obsolete. Uh, the Impressionists are going out to the landscape and working directly with local color. And uh, grisaille underpaintings are, uh, are now a thing of the past. Um, but a lot of contemporary artists are returning to the use of grisaille uh, underlayers. And, uh, and they're relearning how to use these techniques. So um, just for fun, I want to uh, I did a, just a quick demonstration here of a Caravaggio uh, using um, a, a dark, uh, not perhaps as orangey as his ground, but uh, it's a darkish reddish color. And I want to just do some velaturas on top of this already a very quick under, under uh, layer of uh, grisaille. Now, I want to just uh, talk a little bit about what I did here. So this is a, a red ochre ground with chalk uh, over a linen canvas. Okay, this is a linen canvas. And I prepared it in the historical way. I ground the, the, the pigments, applied it with a, with a, a palette knife, and I pumiced it. And uh, what it yielded is a surface that is, it feels a little bit like a chalkboard. Uh, and it has a nice tooth. Um, I just follow some straightforward uh, um, instructions from different sources. Um, now, the, the color that Caravaggio used for this painting, this is Boy Bitten by a Lizard, perhaps it's a little bit more orangey, such as this one, okay? Um, but this is fun to explore. Um, and I found uh, something very uh, interesting is that if you use just umber and white instead of black and white, you get this sort of greenish effect. And that's sort of what I observed in Caravaggio's painting. I observed in this painting, and you, if you want to check out the painting, you could go to the National Gallery uh, website, nationalgallery.org. They have a detailed um, uh, image of this painting. You can get close up. And um, you'll notice that the uh, underlayer is sort of greenish. And uh, indeed, you get that, that effect with um, by using umber and white, uh, you get sort of this greenish underlayer. And I observed that trend through a lot of uh, his paintings. Um, I, perhaps in some paintings he used white and black, but in others he used umber and white, perhaps. So let's just go ahead and uh, just work with the velatura here and just show you how the velatura works and it's known that Caravaggio used walnut oil and I've prepared walnut oil here with a with the dryers of the age which is litharge and red lead this is a recipe from Palomino and I just I, I just prepared the oil according to Palomino but they indeed do you find walnut oil with or as he bodied walnut oil which is just walnut oil boiled with litharge and red lead. So that's what I'm going to be using as the medium to dilute. Um, I'm just going to pour a little bit of this oil. And in my palette here, let me see if I can get this. I want to get the palette so you can see it. I have a historical palette. Okay. 
I have vermilion, genuine vermilion, genuine carmine, and uh, green umber. Okay, and I just want to, the first thing that I want to do is I'm going to, and this is described by um, Senino Senini. He mentions to put a couch. And what is a couch? Well, it's essentially um, a layer of oil. Uh, I guess today artists uh, call it oiling out. Uh, it is described by a lot of artists. And Palomino, in, in, in his treatise, uh, describes the use of the very oil that I just mentioned to sort of apply a layer and oil out. And this will allow the color to go on there very nicely. And you get this just a beautiful effect. Okay. And again, this is just a demonstration, quick demonstration, just to show you how the velatura works. So I'm going to mix a little bit of white with the vermilion and create very, very soft tone. And you don't want to go heavy with this. You want to just, so by just applying a very, very light layer, you get this optical color. The idea here is to just let that umber, greenish undertone of course, this is a quick demonstration. You could work on this for, for days. And immediately you get to you get a vibration of color between the, the green and the and of course you could paint this in many layers. But you could imagine three or four velaturas on top of this grisar or even two layers of grisai. And I could just leave this color exposed and make the areas that are closer to, you know, that are receiving the extreme light more opaque. Here on the edge, I could make this area a lot more uh, transparent. And not all, I mean, the green is mostly covered, but the idea is to leave that sort of undertone in a very, very delicate way. So if I just wanted to, for example, push the, the red, the red tone, I could do that. You don't want to go too heavy at first. I want to just veil the color. So the wonderful uh, effect of the umber or the greenish umber really gives you a nice vibration of color. What began as a very sort of monochromatic painting, now you begin to get a nice sense of, I mean, the, the uh, vermilion makes the umber seem a lot greener because of the juxtaposition of the complementaries. So this is a wonderful technique, and you could just imagine uh, this painting being developed over weeks, and, you know, just working every detail. Um, in a very, very subtle way. So it's a technique that you can achieve extreme subtlety. And you could also glaze uh, the shadows, meaning that if I wanted to, sh to glaze the shadows, I could do that. And I have here in my palette two umbers. I have a very warm umber and a very cool umber. Okay, so I could just essentially warm up that shadow by just glazing. And 
this overlapping that glaze right here in this area. So these are very, very beautiful techniques that you could explore with just low cost. I mean, these are low cost pigments. Um, and you could work these paintings for hours and just explore. So uh, it's important to, one of the things that I that I've been doing for years is really just recreating um, some of these techniques. The pigments make a big profound difference. It's important too. Um, you could retouch, for example, come back in here if you need it with a more opaque color or semi-translucent color and um, you know, just work this painting for hours and just make it really solid. So, uh, the velatura is a very subtle technique. It takes practice and, you know, it's just uh, it's hours and hours of exploring those tones. So, um, really important to just give yourself the time. So, all right, well, um, I hope you've enjoyed this presentation. Before I go, I'd like to tell you um, I have a, a new course out on Udemy. Uh, it's a, a portrait, classical portrait drawing course. And for those of you that are just getting started uh, with painting or just trying to uh, get some basic skills of proportion, I have uh, three courses now up on Udemy. Uh, I'm very proud of, proud of the content there. I have a classical portrait, excuse me, a classical drawing course. I have a, a Renaissance uh, drawing materials course, and I have the classical portrait course. And um, the, uh, the curriculums of these courses are meant to be progressive, meaning that uh, one course will take you to the next course. And uh, this, uh, this curriculum really gives you the foundation to learn how to paint. So uh, make sure to check out the links in this description below. And uh, make sure to subscribe to the channel and share the content. I'll be coming back in two weeks time. Um, so I'll be, make, uh, be posting the exact uh, date on, on the description below for our next live presentation. And for those of you that are here every week, I'd like to thank you again for your wonderful support, um, the wonderful feedback. Uh, I follow a lot of you uh, on Instagram. I have a lot of my Udemy students here. Thank you for coming by. And I hope you've learned uh, uh, something new today. Um, and uh, I'll continue to share the information, of these wonderful lost techniques. Um, if you have any questions, uh, now is the time. If anybody has any questions, I'd like to, uh, uh, if you have any, you know, any questions I could answer. Okay, well, uh, thanks again for coming by. We'll see you in two weeks' time. Make sure to subscribe and share the content. Have a great weekend.